Robert Emerson Clampett. By now, every animation admirer must have heard of him anyhow, and for a plausible reason, since he's widely considered one of the most idiosyncratic directors. His cartoons are either fan favorite for their over the top and historical pacing and animation, or even disliked for such an edgy tone of his. You either appreciate or dislike him, no half measures. Work in Wacky Land, The Great Piggy Bank Robbery, A Corny Concerto Book Review, these are a few of his most notorious cartoons. However, the main focus here isn't on what he created, but more like on who was behind the aforementioned shorts. Sure enough, Clampett definitely owes its fortune to his animation department, as they essentially depicted his scenes just like how he had conceived them in the first place. It's pretty much of a demanding task, which does totally mirror his eccentric attitude as a supervisor, but his animators were in any case able to play rather freely, thus they could express their talent to the fullest, even if it meant switching them in the same scene just to throw the audience off center. I'll find out his secret if it's the last thing I ever do! And I will too. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Some of the animators happen to be more famous than others, possibly because the audience is more reminiscent of post-1941 Clampett and kind overlooks the black and white material. This video is going to list some of the names who worked in his unit by also analyzing their traits. I won't be following a chronological order, I'll write the corresponding years during the editing. So, the first name that comes to mind is of course Bob McKimson, who worked for almost every director at Warner Brothers, including McKimson in the flesh. Former Declanis assistant back at Disney, his collab with Clampett began once the latter took over outgoing Tex Avery's unit in 1941, when he completed the shorts planned and begun by Avery, like Webby Trouble or Crazy Cruise. Describing McKimson's importance at Warner Brothers would be rather pointless, but, I mean, he created model sheets, he came up with the animation of Bugs Bunny sitting on the Warner shield, as well as the gigantic heads inside the opening rings. As such, he was extremely secure of his artistic role, because he's one of the most gifted artists of all time, and he knew it. The key words to describe Kimson might be character acting triumph and the rock and roll chester. The way he places attention to the tiniest movements like on hands, arms, head inclines and the spot on lip sync do manage to give a more three-dimensional and even realistic standpoint to his performances which tend to turn apparently simple scenes into more complex scenes. When it comes to handle melodramatic moments, Clampett could always rely on his skills. Another crucial name, probably the very first one that comes to fans' minds, is the man Rod Scribner who is likely the key to Clampett's success because he seems to embody his hyperbolic spirit more than any other animator. He did struggle in Hardaway and Dalton and Jones units, but started to get the hang of it with Avery and at last reached his best shape only with Clampett. As you may know, his output is all about aggressiveness and raw power. His expressions witness way more wrinkles than McKimson's, resulting in looking far more cartoonish and fierce, especially with those massive eyes, big, gummy teeth and square toes. The famous bit of Bugs Bunny pondering why Sashi the Turtle could win the race against him showcases forementioned quirks. The manner Scribner gives life to each frame describes Bugs' indignation through and through. That's such comedy peak. Elmer running away from Bucks wearing a skull is another masterful example. Not only his expressions look terrific, but his terror is also depicted by having colors escape from Elmer's silhouette. All in all, in spite of McKimson's crucial role, Scribner will always represent Clampett's rebirth in his quote-unquote edgy oddball era. Let's head back to its black and white period, in which there was a particularly underrated name, John Carey, who more or less acted as Clampett's Rod Scribner before Rod Scribner. Albeit in a lesser context, because, quite honestly, his Porky Pig cartoons are not exactly among his best material, especially after Porky in Wackeland. Since Porky is way too mild and laid back to provide content on his own, he's no Daffy Duck. Though there are a few exceptions, but the fact he stuck to Porky's shorts exclusively couldn't help but fuel a burnout in the long run. 
Otherwise, there wouldn't be another explanation for Porky and Daffy and Porky's picnic to differ this much. Anyway, Carrie's scenes are very bouncy in terms of animation, and the way he draws oversized eyeballs and eyebrows so tall and wrinkled is so distinctive. It's indeed expressive, yet on a lesser note than Scribner. Since we're addressing Clampett's black and white era, Chuck Jones needs an honorable mention. Everyone recalls him as the top director of Rabbit of Seville, Duckamuck, The Haunting Trilogy and so on. But back in the mid-30s, he worked in Tex Avery and Dub Iwerks units as a key animator, just like Clampett. And the two of them also provided some additional corrections in the only couple of shorts directed by Iwerks at Warners. Therefore, no wonder Jones was such an important figure for Clampett, as he provided key animation and also additional supervision in his early entries like Porky's Papa. And considering 1938 is also the year of Jones' debut as a director after Frank Tashlin's departure, it's quite an irony his earlier cartoons used the exact opposite approach by exhibiting somewhat sluggish pacing compared to his more energetic and solid key animation in Clampett's shorts. He's all about craggy, cartoonish expressions with tall and elongated eyes, gummy teeth and apparently he had a tendency to handle intoxicated characters and to include dramatic close-ups. His departure was such a bloody loss for Clampett. Conversely, Itzy Alice popped up in both eras, the black and white and also in Clampett's final year at Warner's in 1946. He tends to draw pretty slim and simplified figures, also including arms and feet, and has a thin dry brush twirl around heads or busts while moving. Take a look at how much his Daffy Duck differs from the others. He's more stripped down and less over the top, also with unusual toes. As for the remaining top players, Manny Gould is one of Clampett's most representative men alongside McKimson and Scribner, as his animation is all about raw power like Scribner, but also adding extra depth to his movements like McKimson. His exaggerated and theatrical gestures and poses do make characters' reactions far more humorous. Like in this scene in which Taffy finds out he just received a call from the draft board, and his reaction is such a character acting feast, with a perspective making his head so huge and wide open mouth ruining the voice actor's vocal cords further. Artwise, his approach features a few similarities with McKimson, especially when it comes to draw dozy eyes. But his frantic smears and massive toes feel like his most unique traits. He's such a huge and a very idiosyncratic animator. Outgoing from every studio like McKimson and Scribner, Virgil Ross is another sublime animator among the most talented veterans therein, who displayed such finesse and grace in his character animation by suggesting way more natural and realistic poses and gestures, like stretching arms or indicating objects, often emphasized by F.T. Smith and loose pacing. He's by all means exceptional within Clampett's zany context, as it's likely more used to Scribner or Gould's raw powers, whereas Rose represents the exact opposite pattern, therefore it's not a surprise his stay in his unit lasts way less, also because the two didn't get along very well. No matter how enormous his talent proved to be, he actually seemed to find a more suitable environment with Tex Avery and Fritz Freeling. Regardless, his scenes remain very strong. On the other hand, Bob Cannon's performance in black and white era staff happens to look far softer than its ensuing animation from Jones and Avery's cartoons at MGM in the 40s. Perhaps the fact he stuck to Porky Shorts exclusively in the 30s must have to do with such an idea, which features some shockingly solider and less blobby drawings with Mickey Mouse-like plump hands. The only things reminiscent of his most notorious scenes in the 40s are his tall eyes, tiny eyebrows and round teeth. His black and white scenes might not be that bad, but Jones' more limited and smeary attitude would sound more fitting for his career. Mexican animator Bill Melendez started off as Scribner's assistant at Warner Brothers upon leaving Disney in 1941. As a result, it's pretty evident Melendez was influenced by him, as his scenes maintain the same strong expressivity, yet with bigger pupils and less wrinkles and are animated in a more refined manner, usually displaying his trademark open palm pose and smears. Sometimes separating the two might be kinda tough, 
so the key would be analyzing their timing, since Melendez's animation looks more delicate, whereas Scribner is quite more aggressive. As per the others, Norm McCabe was in his black and white unit and actually progressed as a co-director in early 40s a couple of times during Clappett's illness, and later on he would also inherit his former animation staff once Clappett took over at going Tech Savory's unit. Unlike his elder, McCabe would only release black and white shorts, either with Daffy Duck as a protagonist or being set in wartime, like the infamous Japan bashing propaganda Tokyo Jokyo. Even though Cal Dalton was one of freelance animators in the early 40s, he regardless animated in Porky Spooch, his spinal black and white short, and in a private snuff entry later on, as well as becoming one of McCabe's regulars in 1942. His chubby and snubbish figures are just impossible to miss. Basil Davidovic is another former Disney animator who is more like a pose to pose artist compared to McKimson or Gould, yet his movements feel quite fluid given his origins. Tom McKimson is Bob's older brother, and just like him, he began at Disney but as Norm Ferguson's assistant. Even though he takes the role of key animator for Clampett in 1943, he's actually better known as a layout artist, therefore his art style is still uncertain to decipher, most likely resembles Bob's with some minor differences. Former freeling animator Gil Turner would also become a member of Clampett's unit, but his work would often be corrected by McKimson, since it kinda looks a bit wonky and unstable at parts. And while Phil Moreau's career is actually more fond of Jones and Freeling to a certain degree, he also briefly joined the Clampett's unit in 1943. His snappy character acting usually plays a big role in Jones' cartoons, but he too gets overwhelmed by McKimson's additional corrections. Other names include Sid Sutherland and Rev Cheney, who were also part of Avery's final unit like McKimson, Scribner and Ross. Disney legend Art Babbitt who animated Daffy's infamous striptease scene, and Finnish American by Baristo, who was basically Chuck Jones' replacement in 1938. On top of that, even Art Davis, Lou Appet, Freda Bruns, former Disney Shamus Cullain, and Lou Garnier worked for Clampett at some point. However, it's still unknown what they did on the specific. It's only a speculation, but maybe a branch was part of his final unit in 1946, and Davis possibly appeared in shorts like Russian Rhapsody, but again, it remains a question point. I hope you enjoyed this ride, if so, be sure to expect some more animation guides about another classic director in the following month.